Well, hello everyone. Um, this is Guido from. I decided to start this new podcast where I'm just going to be reading short horror stories that I have enjoyed in the past. Um, I just want to share it with other people. Um, I'm really new into podcasting and this sort of stuff, recording my own voice, talking to a lot of people, reaching out to people. Um, So I'm just going to hop into it. Um, The first story that I chose is The Hellbound Heart by Clive Barker. Um, He's he's one of my favorite horror authors. He has the Books of Blood written. He has a lot of movies that have been adapted. A lot of the stories have been adapted to TV like The Midnight Meat Train, um, Dread, which was a good one. Um, the Hellraiser movies are actually inspired off this book. Um, I was thinking of doing, like, one chapter at a time, or I might just do it differently, I don't know, I'll just see where it goes. Um, but yeah, I'll just hop into it. I'll I'll try to cover the books cover to cover too, so I'll read whatever that's on the cover, read whatever that's in the back, if it pertains to the book. Um, so yeah, this is The Hellbound Heart by Clive Barker. Oh, and I'll, I'll try to voice the characters to make it interesting for you guys. So yeah, this is a classic tale of supernatural obsession from the criti- critically acclaimed Master of Darkness. Um, the back page is Frank Cotton's insatiable appetite for the dark pleasure of pain led him to the puzzle of Le Marchand's box, and from there to a death only a sick-minded soul could admit. But his brother's love-crazed wife, Julia, has discovered a way to bring Frank back, though the price will be bloody and terrible, and there will be certainly be hell to pay. Alrighty. About the order. Born and raised in England, Clive Barker is the internationally best-selling author of 20 books, ranging in subject from epic adult horror fiction to the award-winning modern classic children's series, Aberrath. Also widely acclaimed artist and film producer, he is best known as the writer and director of the 1987 cult classic horror film, Hellraiser, a film which explores the theme of sadomasochism, pain as a source of pleasure, and morality under duress and fear. The film is based on Barker's critically acclaimed novella, The Hellbound Heart, and is the first in the Hellraiser series. Having spawned seven sequels as of 2006, with a remake of the original announced in 2007. The movie was ranked number 19 on Bravo's list of the 100 scariest movie moments. Clive makes his home in Beverly Hills, California. Visit him on his website at www.clivebarker.info.com. Books by Clive Barker. Galilee, Forms of Heaven, Sacrament, Incarnations, Everville, The Thief of Always, Magica, The Great and Secret Show, The Hellbound Heart, Books of Blood, Volumes 1 through 3, In the Flesh, The Inhuman Condition, The Damnation Game, We World, Cabal, Cold Heart Canyon, Aberat, Aberat, Days of Magic, Knights of War. Clive Barker, The Hellbound Heart. For Mary. I long to talk with some old lover's ghost, who died before the god of love was born. John Don, Love's Deity. The Hellbound Heart. 1. So intent was Frank upon solving the puzzle of Le Marchand's box that he didn't hear the great bell begin to ring. The device had been constructed by a master craftsman, and the riddle was this, that though he'd been told the box contained wonders, there simply seemed to be no way into it, no clue on any of its six black lacquered faces as to the whereabouts of the pressure points that would disengage one piece of this three-dimensional jigsaw from another. Frank had, been, had, Frank had seen similar puzzles, mostly in Hong Kong, products of Chinese taste for making metaphysics of hardwood. 
but to the acuity and technical genius of the Chinese, the Frenchman had brought a perverse logic that was entirely his own. If there was a system to the puzzle, Frank had failed to find it. Only after several hours of trial and error did a chance juxtaposition of Tom's middle and last fingers bear fruit, an almost imperceptible click, and then victory. A segment of the box slid out from beside its neighbors. There were two revelations. The first, that the interior surfaces were brilliantly polished. Frank's reflection, distorted, fragmented, skated across the lacquer. The second, that Le Marchand, who had continued, he had constructed the box so that opening it tripped the musical mechanism, which began to tinkle a short round of sublime banality. Encouraged by his success, Frank proceeded to work on the box feverishly, quickly finding fresh alignments of fluted slot and oiled peg, which in turn revealed further intricacies. And with each solution, each new half-twist or pull, a further melodic element was brought into play. The tune counterpointed and developed until the initial caprice was all but lost in ornamentation. At some point in his labors, the bell had begun to ring, a steady, somber tolling. He had not heard, at least not consciously. But when the puzzle was almost finished, the mirrored innards of the box unknotted. He became aware that his stomach churned so violently at the sound of the bell, it might have been ringing half a lifetime. He looked up from his work. For a few moments, he supposed the noise to be coming from somewhere in the street outside. But he rapidly dismissed that notion. It had been almost midnight before he'd begun work at the birdmaker's box. Several hours had gone by. Hours he would not have remembered. Passing, but for the evidence of his watch. Since then, there was no church in the city. However, desperate for adherence, that would ring a summoning bell at such an hour. No. The sound was coming from somewhere much more distant. Though the very door, as yet invisible, that Le Marchand's miraculous box had been constructed to open, everything that Kircher, who had sold him the box, had promised of it was true. He was on the threshold of a new world, a province infinitely far from the room in which he sat. Infinitely far, yet now suddenly near. The thought had made his breath quick. He had anticipated this moment so keenly, planned with every wit he possessed this rendering of the whale. In moments, they would be here, the ones Kircher had called the Cenobites, theologians of the order of Gash, summoned from their experiments in the high reaches of pleasure, to bring their ageless heads into a world of rain and failure. He had worked ceaselessly in the preceding week to prepare the room for them. The bare boards had been meticulously scrubbed and strewn with petals. Upon the west wall he had set up a kind of altar to them, decorated with kind of placatory offerings Kircher had assured him him would nurture their good offices, bones, bonbons, needles. A jug of his urine, the product of seven days' collection, stood on the left of the altar, should they require some spontaneous gesture of self-defilement. On the right, a plate of dolls' heads, which Kershaw had also advised him to have on hand. He had left no part of the invocation ritual unobserved. No cardinal, eager for the fisherman's shoes, could have been more diligent. But now, as the sound of the bell became louder, drowning out the music box, he was afraid. Too late, he murmured to himself, hoping to quell his rising fear. Le Marchand's device was undone. The final trick had been turned. There was no time left for prevarication or regret. Besides, hadn't he risk, risked both life and sanity to, to make this unveiling possible? The doorway was even now opening to pleasures no more than a handful of humans had ever known existed, much less tasted. Pleasures which would redefine the parameters <clears throat> of sensation which would release him from the dull round of desire, seduction, and disappointment that had dogged him from late ad ad adolescence. He would be transformed by that knowledge, wouldn't he? No man could experience the profundity of such feeling and remain unchanged. The bare bulb in the middle of the room dimmed and brightened, brightened and dimmed again. 
it had taken on the rhythm of the bell, burning its hottest on each chime. In the throes between the chimes, the darkness in the room became utter. It was as if the world he had occupied for twenty-nine years had ceased to exist. Then the bell would sound again, and the bulb burned so strongly it might never have faltered. And for a few precious seconds he was standing in a familiar place, with a door that led out and down into the street, and a window through which he had but the will or strength to tear the blinds back, he might glimpse a rumor of morning. With each peal, the bulb's light was becoming more revelatory. By it, he saw the east wall flayed, saw the brick momentarily lose solidity and blow away, saw, in, that in, in the same instant, the place beyond the room from which the bell's din was issuing. A world of birds, was it? Last black birds caught in perpetual tempest. That was all the sense he could make of the province, from which even now... The hierophants were coming, that it was in confusion and full of brittle, broken things that rose and fell and filled the dark air with their fright. And then the wall was sawed again, and the bell fell silent. The bulb flickered out. This time it went without a hope of rekindling. He stood in the darkness and said nothing. Even if he could remember the words of welcome he'd prepared, his tongue would not have spoken them. It was plain, dead in his night, and then light. It came from them, from the quarter of Cenobites, who now, with the wall sealed behind them, occupied the room. A fitful phosphorescence like the glow of deep-sea fishes, blue, cold, charmless. It stuck Frank that he had never once wondered what they would look like. His imagination, though fertile when it came to trickery and theft, was impoverished in other regards. The skill to picture these eminences was beyond him, so he had not even tried. Why then was he so distressed to say, set eyes upon them? Was it the scars that covered every inch of their bodies, the flesh cosmetically punctured and sliced and infibulated, then dusted down with ash? Was it the smell of vanilla they brought with them, the sweetness of which did little to disguise the stench beneath? Or was it that as the light grew, and he scanned them more closely, he saw nothing of joy or even humanity in their maimed faces? Only desperation and an appetite that made his bowels ache to be voided. What city is this? One of the four inquired. Frank had difficulty guessing the speaker's gender with any certainty. Its clothes, some of which were soon to and through, its skin hid its private parts, and there was nothing in the dregs of its voice or in its willfully disfigured features that offered the least clue. When it spoke, the hooks that transfixed the flaps of its eyes and were wed by an intricate system of chains passed through flesh and bone alike to similar hooks through the lower lip were teased by the motion, exposing the glistening meat beneath. I asked you a question it said. Frank made no reply. The name of the city was the last thing on his mind. Do you understand? The figure beside his first speaker demanded. Its voice, unlike that of its companion, was light and breathy. The voice of an excited girl. Every inch of its head had been tattooed with an intricate grit, and at every intersection of horizontal and vertical axes a jeweled pin driven through the bone. Its tongue was similarly decorated. Do you even know who we are? It asked. Yes, Frank said at last. I know. Of course he knew. He and Kirsch had spent long nights nice talking of hints gleaned from the diaries of Bolingbroke and Giles de Ray. All that mankind knew of the Order of the Gash, he knew. And yet, he had expected something different, expected some sign of numberless splendors that had access to. He had thought they would come with women, at least oiled women milked woman, woman shaved and muscled for the act of love, their lips perfumed, their thighs trembling to spread, their buttocks weighty, the way he liked them. He had expected sighs and languid bodies spread on the floor underfoot like a living carpet. He had expected virgin whores, whose every crevice was, for, was his for the asking and whose skills would press him, upward, upward, to undreamed of ecstasies. 
the world would be forgotten in their arms. He would be exalted by his lust, instead of despised for it. But no, no woman, no size. Only these sexless things with their corrugated flesh. Now the third spoke. Its features were so heavily scarified, the wounds nurtured until they ballooned. That its eyes were vi invisible and its words corrupted by the disfigurement of its mouth. What do you want? it asked him. He perused the questioner more confidently than he had the other two. His fear was draining away with every second that passed. Memories of the terrifying place beyond the wall were already receding. He was left with these decrepit decadence, with their stench, their queer deformity, their self-evident frailty. The only thing he had to fear was nausea. Kershaw told me that there would be five of you, Frank said. The engineer will arrive short should the Mormon merit, came the reply. Now again, we ask you, what do you want? Why should he not answer them straight? Pleasure, he replied. Kershaw said, you know about pleasure. Oh, we do, said the first of them. Everything you ever wanted. Yes? Of course, of course, he stared at him with his all too naked eyes. What have you dreamed? it said. The question, put so baldly, confounded him. How could he hope to articulate the nature of the phantasms his libido had created? He was still searching for words when one of them said, This world, it disappoints you. Pretty much, he replied. You're not the first to tire of its trivialities, came the response. There have been others. Not many, the gritted face put in. True, a handful at best, but a few have dared to use Le Marchand's configuration. Men like yourself, hungry for new possibilities, who heard that we have skills unknown in your region. I'd expected, Frank began. We know what you expected, the Cenobite replied. We understand, to its breath and death, the nature of your frenzy. It is utterly familiar to us. Frank grunted. So, he said, you know what I dreamed about? You can supply the pleasure? The thing's face broke open, its lips curling back, a baboon smile. Not as you understand it, came the reply. Frank made to interrupt, but the creature raised a silencing hand. These are conditions of nerve endings, it said. The like of which your imagination... However, Feward could not hope to evoke. Yes? Oh yes, almost oh, certainly. Your most treasured depravity is child's play, besides the experiences we offer. Will you partake of them? said the second Cenobite. Frank looked at the scars and the hooks. Again, his tongue was deficient. Will you? Outside, somewhere near, the world would soon be waking. He had watched it wake from the window of this very room. Day after day, stirring itself to another round of fruitless pursuits, and he'd known, known that there was nothing left out there to excite him. No heat, only sweat. No passion, only sudden lust. And just as sudden indifference, he had turned his back on such dissatisfaction. If in doing so, he had interpreted the signs these creatures brought him. Then that was the price of ambition. He was ready to pay it. Show me, he said. There is no going back. You do understand that? Show me. They needed no further invitation to raise the curtain. He had heard the door creak as it was opened, and turned to see that the world beyond the threshold had disappeared, to be replaced by the same panic-filled darkness from which the members of the Order had stepped. He looked back towards the Cenobites, seeking some explanation for this. But they disappeared. Their passing had not gone on the recorded, however. They had taken the flowers with them, leaving only bare boards. And on the wall, the offerings he had assembled were blackening, as if in the heat of some fierce but invisible flame. He smelt the bitterness of their consumption. It pricked his nostrils so acutely he was certain they would bleed. But the smell of burning was the, was only the beginning. No sooner had he registered it than half a dozen of other scents filled his head. Perfumes he had scarcely noticed until now were suddenly overpoweringly strong. 
the lingering scent of filched blossoms, the smell of the paint on the ceiling, and the sap in the wood beneath his feet, all filled his head. He could even smell the darkness outside the door, and in it, the ordure of a hundred thousand birds. He put his hands to his mouth and nose, to stop the onslaught from overcoming him, but the stench of perspiration in his fingers made him giddy. He might have been driven to nausea, had there not been fresh sensations flooding his system from each nerve ending and taste bud. It seemed he could suddenly feel the collision of the dust not motes with his skin. Every drawn breath chafed his lips, every blink his eyes, bile turned in the back of his throat, and a morsel of yesterday's beef that had been lodged between his teeth sent spasms through his system as it executed a droplet of gravy upon his tongue. His ears were no less sensitive. His head was filled with a thousand dins, some of which he himself was father to. The air that broke against his eardrums was a hurricane. The flatulence in his bowels was a thunder. But there were other sounds, innumerable sounds, which assailed him from somewhere beyond himself. Voices raised in anger, whispered professions of love, roars and rattlings, snatches of song, tears. Was it the world he was hearing? Morning breaking in a thousand homes, had he no chance to listen closely. The cacophony drove any power of analysis from his head, but there was worse. The eyes, oh God in heaven, he had never guessed that they could be such torment. He who thought there was nothing on earth left to startle him, now he reeled. Everywhere in sight, the plain plaster of ceiling was an awesome geography of brush strokes. The weave of his plain shirt, an unbearable elaboration of threads. In the corner he saw a mite move on a dead doe's head, and then wink its eyes at him, seeing that he saw too much, too much. <coughs> Excuse me. Appalled, he shut his eyes, but there was more inside than out. Memories whose violence shook him to the verge of senselessness. He sucked his mother's milk and choked, felt his sibling's arms around him, a fight was it or, or a brotherly embrace? Either way, it suffocated. And more, so much more. A short lifetime of sensation, all written a perfect hand upon his cortex, and breaking, breaking him with the insistence that they be remembered. He felt close to exploding. Surely the world outside his head, the room, and the birds beyond the door, they, for all their shrieking excesses, could not be as overwhelming as his memories. Better that, he thought, and tried to open his eyes. They, they wouldn't unglue. Tears or pus or needle and thread had sealed them up. He thought of the faces of the Cenobites, the hooks, the chains. Had they worked some similar surgery upon him, locking him up behind his eyes with a parade of his history? In fear for his sanity, he began to address, address them, though he was no longer certain they were even with an earshot. Why? he asked. Why are you doing this to me? The echo of his words roared in his ears, but he scarcely attended to it. More sense impressions were swimming up from the past to torment him. Childhood still lingered on his tongue, milk and frustration. But there were adult feelings joining it now. He was grown. He was mustached and mighty, hands heavy, got large. Youthful pleasures has, had possessed the appeal of newness, but as the years had crept on, the mild sensation lost its potency. Stronger and stronger experiences had been called for, and here they came again, more pungent being laid in the darkness at the back of his head. He felt untold tastes upon his tongue, bitter, sweet, sour, salty, smelt spice and shit, and his mother's hair, saw cities and skies, saw speed, saw deeps, broke bread with men now dead, and was scalded by the heat of their spittle on his cheek, and of course there were women. Always, amid the flurry and confusion, memories of women appeared, assaulting him with their scents, their textures, their tastes. The proximity of this harem aroused him, despite circumstances. He opened his trousers and caressed his cock, more eager to have the seed spilled and so be freed of these creatures than for the pleasure of it. He was dimly aware, as he worked his inches, that he must make a pitiful sight. A blind man in an empty room, aroused for a dream's sake, 
but the racking, joyous orgasm failed to even slow the relentless display. His knees buckled and his body collapsed to the boards where his spunk had fallen. There was a spasm of pain as he hit the floor, but the response was washed away before another wave of memories. He rolled onto his back and screamed, screamed and begged for an end to it, but the sensations only rose higher still. Whipped to fresh heights with every prayer for cessation he offered up. The pleas became a single sound, words and sense eclipsed by panic. It seemed there was no end to this but madness, no hope but to be lost to hope. As he formulated this last despairing thought, the torment stopped. All at once, all of it, gone. Sight, sound, touch, taste, smell. He was abruptly bereft of them all. There were seconds then when he doubted his very existence. Two heartbeats. Three. Four. On the fifth beat, he opened his eyes. The room was empty. The doves and the piss pot gone. The door was closed. Gingerly, he sat up. His limbs were tingling. His head, wrist, and bladder ached. And then, a movement at the other end of the room drew his attention. Where two moments before there had been an empty space, there was now a figure. It was the fourth Cenobite, the one that had never spoken nor shown its face. Not it. He now saw, but she. The hood it had worn had been discarded, as had the ropes. The woman beneath was gray yet gleaming, her lips bloody, her legs parted so that the elaborate scarification of her pubis was displayed. She sat in a pile of rotten human heads and smiled in welcome. The collision of sensuality and death appalled him. Could he have any doubt that she had personally dispatched his, these victims? Their rot was beneath her nails, and their tongues, twenty or more, lay out in ranks on her oiled thighs, as if awaiting entrance. Nor did he doubt that the brains now seeping from their ears and nostrils had been driven to insanity. Before a blow or a kiss had stopped their hearts, Kersher had lied to him. Either that, or he had been horribly deceived. There was no pleasure in the air, or at least not as humankind understood it. He had made a mistake opening Le Marchand's box, a very terrible mistake. Oh, so you finished dreaming, said the Cenobite, cruising as he lay panning on the bare boards. Good. She stood up. The tongues fell to the floor like a rain of slugs. Now we can begin, she said. Well, that was the end of the first chapter. Um, so I kind of want to make this different than what other people do when they read books that I've seen on YouTube and stuff like that, or on iTunes podcast and stuff where they, they just go through the book nonstop. So what I want to do is actually like read a chapter or two and then talk about it. Um, what my thoughts are on the book. Uh, what happened that chapter, keep it interesting, maybe have some like um, other things that I can um, draw connections to. Um, so yeah, the the way the, this book opens up is very unique compared to a lot of stories that I read through. It doesn't start slow, it starts with a bang. You have a lot of vivid imagery. Um, and the other thing that I love, about Clive Barker is that he is not scared of including sexuality in his works. Um, a lot of his short stories and stuff like that that I've read from him um, have characters that are very into their sexuality um, and are very open about it. For example, one of his stories, one of my favorite stories from him from Books of Blood um, has this gay couple that are on a road trip, like a sightseeing trip on the countryside, and they run into these two villages that actually, I think every year or every 10 years or something like that, they come together and form these huge hawking giant beasts uh, made up of the human bodies of like the, the residents of the villages. They're like these uh, gargantuan giants that are put together by bodies, like human bodies make the, the bones, human bodies make the muscles, the tendons and stuff like that, and they have to work together to move the, these giants. And these two villages 
fight using these giants and people die, people get smashed and stuff like that. And these two, this couple, um, ends up, um, in the middle of this fight and they lose their minds. Like it's like a very traumatic experience to them. But in that story, like the, the couple's sexuality is not, like Clive Ark is not scared to talk about it, so it actually makes the characters more believable. It makes them more fleshed out, more alive in the story. They don't feel cardboard. Um, so yeah, while I was reading the book, it, in the beginning it also said that Clive Barker directed the first Hellraiser. I completely forgot about that, so that's a pretty cool part about Clive Barker's resume. Um, uh, that he directs movies, I know that he made that, um, uh, he had two, uh, video games to Undying and Jericho, I think, Clive Barker's Jericho Undying was pretty cool from what I heard, I played only the beginning portion of it, I never ended up, uh, completing it, and I heard that Jericho had some mixed reviews and Clive himself wasn't actually really that fond of it, um, yeah, so I'll leave at that with the Hellbound Heart for today. Um, there are a couple of things that I want to talk about too in the of things that are happening in the horror genre. So I know that um, there are a couple of movies that got released recently. There's The, um, the Conjuring 2 which I haven't seen yet but I heard uh, really good stuff about it actually. I had some friends who watched it. They were saying that wasn't as good as the first Conjuring but it was still a pretty decent movie and then I had some people who I talked to who said that it was actually much more scarier, much uh, better written, much better acting, and stuff like that. Um, the the recent movie that I actually had the chance of seeing was that um, what was it called? Uh, it's that it's the boy, I think. It's about that movie who where there's that like little puppet boy, and then there's that girl from The Walking Dead who has to babysit this puppet. I think it's called The Boy. Let me look it up. Yeah, The Boy. It's called The Boy. But yeah, I didn't get the best reviews, but I think it was pretty decent. Um, I had a nice twist to it at the end. I won't spoil it for you guys. But um, I wouldn't say don't go into it expecting like a, a masterpiece. It's just like a nice goofy movie that you can sit down one weekend night like a sunday night and just waste time watching it i wouldn't maybe maybe it's worth renting for like a two dollars 99 cents on a streaming service um but other than that i wouldn't i wouldn't buy a dvd of it uh maybe it was like five dollars i would buy a physical copy of it just to put it in my collection um, but the, yeah, the big thing that I want to talk about is that, uh, there's a, the It remake that's coming, Stephen King's It. Um, I just actually ended up looking at the, um, the big reveal of who is going to be playing Pennywise the Clown. Um, let me get the actor's name, I'll pull him up. Stephen King, It. Remake. There we go. Yeah, the first image of Pennywise the Clowns. Yeah, that got released. And what I can say is, yeah, it, it looks pretty good from what I can see. It's just like a still image. The clown looks pretty scary, Pennywise. Um, the actor that they chose, which is uh, yeah, let me see, let's see the guy's name, the actor that they chose really looks like Tim Curry, the original per guy that played um, Pennywise the Clown, um, let's see, One of the best friends is completely traumatized by the real film version of it. Yeah, they got a clown expert on the movie, I guess. Um, 
my computer is acting up right now. Uh, this is annoying, but yeah, while I try to look at it, I'll talk about it. Um, the the first the the first movie, I guess you would say, the two movies, the original one, because it's such a long, like there's the part where they're still kids, and then there's the part where they're adults. Um actually really traumatized me as a kid when I watched it. I was really young when I saw it. I was maybe like 10 or so. Um, and a couple of the scenes when they were actually kids ended up getting ingrained in my head. The part where that wimpy kid's in the shower and the coach like makes him take a shower even though he doesn't want to, which is which is pretty weird, and Pennywise comes out of the drainage, the, the shower heads, like, extend and go towards the kid, and Pennywise, like, stretches out the drainage and pops his head out, and he's like, we all float, we all float, that was, like, a scary part for me, um, the part where that female character is adult and he goes to her dad's house and instead of her dad living there there's that lady who ends up being actually the penny pennywise the clown and like he gives her a cup of tea that ends up being blood and then her face changes to her dad's and then chases her out of the house was a part that was a heavy hitter um there, there were a couple of shortcomings in the original movie. I don't think they were able to tie up the movie as good. I think they could have played out the the alien Lovecraftian creature from outer space who comes every couple of years to feast on kids and go more efficiently. The creature wasn't imposing at all at the end. Like, Tim Curry as Pennywise the Clown was scarier than the final reveal of the creature. I think the reveal should have been something... Well, the so Stephen King has a lot of inspiration from H.P. Lovecraft. Um, in his books, he's a big fan of him. And he was clearly going for a Lovecraftian, like, cosmic creature. And a lot of Lovecraft's material and creatures are beings where a normal human mind seeing that creature cannot handle the realities of it so many of the protagonists of H.P. Lovecraft stories go mad after finally coming in contact with the horrors that they have to face and Pennywise or it didn't have that impact in the movie in the book I think Stephen King did a better job of conveying that feeling but in the movie I, I guess it was because at the time the special effects weren't as advanced but um, it just, I don't think they did a good job in giving that dread, that fear of that creature's reveal. And then, of, of course, everybody has that problem of just the creature getting beaten by those like silver earrings and asthma spray, which was kind of a lame point in the movie. But yeah, I, I can say that I'm very excited about this remake. That's going to come next year. Um, it's something that I'll be looking forward to. I'll probably watch it in the movies. Even though, even if it's not good, if the reviews are bad, I'll just give it a chance just to give it justice. So, because that had such an impact on my childhood when I saw it, especially when I can still imagine Pennywise like looking at little Georgie from the drainage, going, hey Georgie, come here, we all float, we all float here. Like, Tim Curry had such a good performance in that movie. It's like a bone-chilling performance. But yeah, other than that, there are a couple of movies that I want to catch. I want to watch um, Eli Roth's Green Inferno. That's the remake for Cannibal Holocaust. Um, and then, let me think. What else do I want to catch? Oh, yeah, Eli Roth's uh, Clown Movie. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, I have, like itch on my throat but yeah Eli Ross clown movie where 
um, the dad, like, turns into clown for wearing his clown suit. It's like a curse suit or something like that. And then another upcoming release that we don't have a lot of information on is uh, Rob Zombie's 31, which is going to be a clown movie that's going to be coming out. We don't have really that much information about it. We have, like, a, like a short teaser trailer. It looks pretty cool. It's like a, like a circus funhouse kind of theme to it where, like, a bunch of uh, adults have to survive uh, this deadly game that they're thrust into. It's like a bunch of fucking clowns that are trying to kill them. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Of course, he, uh, Sherry Moon Zombies acting in the movie like all of Rob Zombie's movies. I like her as an actor. I think, even though, I don't, I don't think, um, uh, as a, like, uh, critically, I think the, his last movie was good, um, uh, Lord of Salem, I don't think it was, like, a, like, a, I don't know, if it was, like, I don't think it would be featured in a Sundance Film Festival or something like that, but as a Rob Zombie movie, as a, as a weird, like, indie horror movie, I really enjoyed watching it, I, I love the characters, I love the acting in it, I love the atmosphere, um, I think everything, like all the acting, and it was believable. You could really feel the, the, the main character that Shadow Moon Zombie portrays, like delve into madness and despair as the couple of bitches are trying to get her. Um. So yeah, I, I really enjoyed her acting. I enjoyed her acting in Devil's Rejects. I enjoyed her acting in um, Halloween as the mom of Michael Myers. I think she, she portrayed her frustration really well, too, and her depression after her kid went bonkers on an apeshit killing spree. I think uh, Rob Zombie's Halloween remakes don't get a, get a lot of flack, too. That's undeserved. I think they're great remakes. I think they're one of some of the best horror remakes that have been out so far. Like, I watched the Friday the 13th remake, which that guy from Supernaturals in, the guy that plays Sam in Supernatural, he's in that, um, Halloween, uh, Friday the 13th remake, um, which is an okay movie, it was just like a basic bare bones slasher, there was really nothing new, nothing earth shattering, uh, revolutionary in that movie, it was just like the remake of the second movie, I think, and it wasn't, I wasn't impressed, it didn't get any standing ovation from me. I don't know, the, the the horror genre is, like, very stagnated right now. So if you want to find some original stuff, new stuff, like, you have to actually go look at old movies that have been, really, that have been released that you haven't seen. Uh, like, some of those movies that have really surprised me was Candyman. Actually, that's another Clive Barker movie, if I'm not mistaken. But, yeah, Candyman. Uh, with that big guy big black guy, oh, what was his name, I forget, but he's, he has been in a bunch of movies, he's a really good actor, but yeah, he plays Candyman, but I, I expected going into that movie, like, it was gonna be like a, like a stupid movie, like Wishmaster, or freaking Leprechaun, or some shit like that, and I ended up being thoroughly impressed, um, the acting was great, the story was great, the, the, they, they were able to get a goofy premise, like a Bloody Mary ripoff. I don't know if the Candyman legend is like an actual urban legend in the real world, I don't know, but it's basically like if you go say Candyman three times, if you get Candyman, 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 or like you do like a stupid fucking movement or right shit, I, I don't even remember right now, the fucking Candyman comes and tries to kill you with his bees and his hook and shit, like... Apparently, like, he was, like, a slave guy that got his, um, girlfriend killed by slave owners, and then he was tortured or something like that. I, I don't really remember, but, yeah, he appears and tries to kill you. But it's, like, a very basic, goofy premise, and the movie was able to go along with it and make the most out of it. It was, like, a very enjoyable watch for me. But, yeah, that's another Clive Barker movie. Um, but other than that, yeah... 
I'm coming up on fifth, yeah, almost 50 minutes shortly. So, um, yeah, another thing that I want to address, address is, yeah, if you guys have any um, complaints about my reading and stuff like that, um, English is my second language. So I came to America in my sophomore year, so my English is not as good as like a native speaker's and I do have an accent so if I mispronounce some words just bear with it maybe you can like have the story buy the story and like read along with it but yeah, I will hopefully I'll get better and better as I go along doing this um, yeah I just wanted a hobby like a second thing to do I have I've listened to a lot of other podcasts, like Joe Rogan's podcast, the uh, Fighter and the Kid podcast, and a lot of go, a lot of those guys have inf- inspired me. And like the basic advice that all those guys give is that you just sit down and talk and do what you want to do. So all my podcasts are gonna be unedited, um, as is. It's gonna be a stream of streams of consciousness maybe i'll have have other people join in at some points to like talk to or interview or like bullshit together with maybe read a story and talk about it together maybe like read it together voice different characters together i don't know there's a lot of things that we can do but i'm gonna try to keep this podcast like horror centric like the horror genre and stuff like that talk about movies talk about stories talk about authors and then we'll see where it goes from there. But yeah, uh, thanks for listening to my podcast. I haven't even chosen the name yet. It will pop up in the future. This is going to be the first episode to it. Or maybe like the prologue, episode zero. We'll see what happens. But yeah, um, thanks for listening. Um, I don't have any links or like pages to promote right now that I have. Um, so those will probably pop up in the future like maybe a facebook page like a facebook group maybe an instagram or something like that uh but for now it's just this so i hope you enjoyed it hope you enjoyed listening to my dumb voice my stupid ass so have fun and get fucked guys peace out